I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles this morning to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9, page 332, I believe, using the Adoration Bibles, 332. We'll read this whole chapter together. Second Samuel chapter 9 comes to us in the context of King David's victories. If you turn back just one chapter, that's the title the ESV Bibles give us, David's victories. And what that chapter does for us is, is gives us a glimpse into the glory of Christ's kingdom. His kingdom is a kingdom where all of his enemies have been brought under the king's feet. As you know, King David is the man after God's own heart. He serves as a shadow of that greater king to come. And so in the wake of King David's victories, we read in verse 15 of chapter 8 that David reigned over all Israel, and David administered justice and equity to all his people. There is a sense of of calm that abides over the kingdom of God as this righteous king brings peace and rest to his people. It's in this context, the context of David's victories, of his being a conquering king, that we read these words in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And David said... Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant, that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belonged to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at King David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. So far, the reading of God's own word may bless it to us as we meditate upon it this morning. Dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you know the story of King David well, then you know that he spent the better part of his youth on the run, running away from King Saul out of fear for his life. For when Saul heard the news that his dynasty would end with him, that it would be given to another, namely to David, Saul made the taking of David's life priority number one in the kingdom of Israel. And so for quite some time, that's the way it was in Israel. Yes, they, they finally had a king of their own, just as they wanted. God gave them a king according to their own desires. A king who chased after his own desires, rather than after the desires of the Lord. King Saul, you see, was not a man after God's own heart, but his fists were constantly raised against the God of heaven. The the theme song of his life might have been captured by those words of Sinatra, I did it my way. And that was King Saul's mantra. 
For although he, he knew the will of the Lord, he would not submit to it in his heart. And so the quest to kill David began. Once again, the, the seed of the serpent waged war against the seed of the woman. But again, if you know the story well, then you know that in God's grace, David had a close friend, a close companion from the household of Saul, Saul's son, Jonathan, the next would-be king over Israel. And by God's grace, the Spirit of Christ had been working in Jonathan's heart. He, he caused Jonathan to, to draw his line in the sand, to side with the man whom, whom God would have to be king over Israel even though doing so meant forfeiting everything that would have otherwise belonged to him. Jonathan, unlike his father Saul, you see, was a true child of God who, who understood the words of that greater king to come before that greater king had been born. He who would save his own life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so Jonathan gave up his life. He gave up his throne. He gave up his reign over Israel to God's chosen king. He gives his loyalty and allegiance to David, and, and he warns David of his father's plot to kill David. And so for many years, King David spent time in hiding, and God kept him safe. God kept him safe from Saul, the seed of the serpent, and eventually God gave him the throne over, and victory over all his enemies. Having all this in the background, you see, makes what we read here in 2 Samuel chapter 9, quite amazing, doesn't it? That King David would, would show kindness to one who belonged to the household of Saul is almost unthinkable. But the kindness of God has gripped King David's heart. And so King David is resolved in his own heart to, to show kindness even to those who, who ought to be counted as his enemies. And such is the beauty of God's kingdom, isn't it? Certainly when you compare God's kingdom to every other kingdom in the world, no kingdom comes close to comparing to God's kingdom. No kingdom in all the world is as glorious or as gracious as God's kingdom. No kingdom in all the world has a king like God's kingdom. And that ought to give us a great source of encouragement this morning. We belong to a kingdom that is unlike any other kingdom in all the world. And we have a king who is truly gentle and lowly of heart. We have a king whose kindness cannot be matched by anyone else. And so as we work our way through this story, boys and girls, we need to see the, the light of the gospel shining brightly in the disposition of David, shining brightly in the words and the actions of King David. Because here in the person of King David, God manifests himself to us. God manifests himself to his enemies. What we have here in this chapter, you see, is not primarily a, a story or, or a lesson in promise keeping, how, how we just need to keep our promises like King David kept his promise. We certainly do need to keep our promises. But if we think that's the point of the story, then we've entirely missed the point of the story. Because the, the character with whom we identify in the story is not King David, the, the kind king who keeps his promises. But the character with whom we need to identify with this morning is unworthy enemy Mephibosheth, who is lame in both his feet, who, who cannot do anything on his own, who has no right whatsoever to come before the presence of the king. That's me. That's you. I am Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is me. That's the key to unlocking the store. If you want to see the, the beauty of God's kindness, of God's covenant mercy in the true King, the Lord Jesus Christ. And just like Mephibosheth, it was according to the promise that you and I also have been granted the privilege to see it, to sit at the king's table. It is a, a promise that doesn't fit the, the logic of the kingdoms of the world, but it is the promise. The king grants unworthy servants a place to sit at his own table. And so as we work our way through this story, we need to know three things this morning. First of all, we need to see the king's unforgotten covenant. Secondly, we need to see the king's unexpected kindness. And finally, the king's unending communion. His unforgotten covenant, his unexpected kindness, and his unending communion. 
our passage begins with the king. And we need to take, take note of that also this morning. Our passage begins with the king, boys and girls, because like all stories of God's grace, initiation always begins with the king. That's why we just sang those cherished words. I sought the Lord, and afterward I knew what? He moved my soul to seek Him seeking me. It was not I who found, O Savior, true. No, I was found, was found of you. God reached forth His hand that He might hold on to our hands. Our passage begins with the king, and David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul? that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. As you may recall, when Jonathan warned David of his father's plan, then and there they made a covenant together, knowing that that it was the common practice in that day for, for a new king to wipe out everyone belonging to the former regime. Jonathan, having sided with David, pled with David in 1 Samuel 20. In that chapter, he said, If I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. Do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on all David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Now having experienced for himself the covenant kindness of God, that that promise that God made just two chapters ago, that God would would build for David a house, that he would establish his throne forever, that his steadfast love would never depart. Having experienced the covenant kindness of God, King David has not forgotten his covenant with Jonathan. And despite the fact that those remaining alive in the household of Saul should be counted his enemies, King David will not falter in keeping his covenant. And so he inquires as to whether anyone is left in the house of Saul that he might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. The word kindness that's used here and throughout the chapter is that same word used throughout the Old Testament for God's covenant love, that word hesed. It's a word that speaks of a loyal love, a word that speaks of a steadfast love. It's a word that speaks of a love that pursues, a love that seeks out, that that takes hold of and never lets go. Perhaps you've heard that rendering of Psalm 23. Many have suggested that perhaps a a more fitting translation would be to say, Surely goodness and mercy shall pursue me all the days of my life, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the kind of kindness that King David aims to show to Mephibosheth for Jonathan's sake, for the sake of the promise that he made so many years before. In fact, he says so clearly in verses 2 and 3. Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And, and King David said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And King David said, Is there not still someone in the house of, of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in both of his feet. David wants to show the kindness of God to this heir of the household of Saul. King David said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. And so King David sent forth and, and he brought him from the house of Machar and to the palace of the king. Congregation, do you see the lengths that covenant love is willing to go? Covenant love is a love that pursues, it is a love that inquires, that that seeks out. It is a love that is steadfast and loyal no matter the cost. It's a love that binds itself to the promise that was made. The story is often told of the great Princeton theologian B.B. Warfield and the love that he had for his dear wife Annie. As the story goes, they they spent the earliest days of their marriage in Germany where their honeymoon overlapped with B.B. Warfield's theological studies. And and one day as they were hiking through the mountains, they were taken by a sudden storm. And and so terrifying was that storm that his dear wife Annie had a nervous breakdown from which she never recovered. 
living out the rest of her life more or less as an invalid, no longer able to, to take care of herself in the most basic of ways. And so for the next 39 years, B.B. Warfield's life was limited to his duties at the seminary and his care for his wife, never leaving her side for more than two hours at a time, only leaving to teach his courses. When the weather was nice, he and his wife would take strolls to the seminary grounds for short little walks between classes. And what stood out most to one of his students, as he records in a personal journal, is that the gentleness of his manner was striking proof of the loving care with which he surrounded her. And such is the love that the God of the covenant has for us this morning. For the sake of his promise, God does not turn aside from his beloved, but he comes to her side and remains at her side forever. And according to his covenant promise, he reassures her again and again, even if you are unfaithful, I will remain faithful, for I will not deny myself. Reflecting on this very thing, Charles Spurgeon once preached a sermon to his congregation in which he proclaimed Christ loved you from before the foundation of the world, and God set his heart upon his children. And then he asked the question, since that time, has he once wavered? Has he once turned aside? Has he ever changed? Surely not. He says, you have tasted of his love and know his grace. And you who have tasted of this love and you who know of his grace will bear me witness that he has been a certain friend in uncertain circumstances. Spurgeon went on to say in that sermon, yes, you have often left him, but has he ever left you? Yes, you have had many trials and troubles, but has he ever deserted you? Has he ever turned away his heart? And the answer is no, children of God. It is your solemn duty to say no and to bear witness to his faithfulness. And here in the person of King David congregation, God manifests himself in that way. He provides for us here in this chapter a a glorious glimpse into the heart of the greater king to come. In a sermon on this passage, John Calvin notes how lamentable a thing that King David took so long to remember his promise. That doesn't seem to be the, the point of this story, but certainly we can learn from there too that Jesus is a greater king. He is not slow to fulfill his promises. As Peter says, he is not slow to fulfill his promises. Some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, wishing that all would repent. Never has Christ failed to keep any of his promises. Never has he forgotten his covenant. But nor that you and I might know his kindness. What did Christ do? He, he sealed that covenant in his own blood as he hung upon the cross. We notice that, secondly, this morning, the king's unexpected kindness. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and, and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold, I am your servant. When Mephibosheth enters the king's presence, he must have been trembling with fear, and there is good reason for that. Because, as I said before, it was indeed the the common practice throughout the ancient world to to wipe out the former regime when a new dynasty began. And so all those who are left with this former regime of of King Saul would be considered as threats, as, as enemies to the kingdom of David. And so lame Mephibosheth has every reason to be afraid. He is a grandson of King Saul. He comes to King David from a place called Lodabar, a place set not so far from Mahanaim, which, if you know your history, is where Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, had, had set himself up as king over Israel, like dense King David, for two years, declaring himself the true king over Israel. In other words, Mephibosheth comes to David as a grandson of Saul from a land of Saul's sympathizers. He is no friend of King David. And if King David is like any other king, then Mephibosheth has good reason to be very afraid. 
But of course, God's king is not like other kings, is he? And so what does King David say? King David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul your father. The king's kindness comes to him at great cost to himself. Surely it's no small thing to to restore to Mephibosheth all that had now rightly belonged to David, that used to belong to King Saul. King David could have easily just forgotten all about that promise made to Jonathan. After all, that that promise was made many years ago, and in some field just between the two of them, no one else probably even knew about it. And now Jonathan is dead. The excuse is not to keep this covenant might abound. But for Jonathan's sake, for the sake of the promise, King David has resolved in his heart to show forth the kindness of Christ. He has resolved in his heart to to restore this son of the former regime, all that had been lost from his father's fall from royalty. I hope that sounds familiar, people of God. Love and kindness being shown to those who are regard who ought to be regarded as enemies. Isn't that we read in Romans chapter five, while we were still weak at the right time, what did Christ do? Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die, but God shows his love for us. And that while we were still enemies, still sinners, Christ died for us. As the apostle goes on to spell out in the rest of that chapter, all of us, we find our natural-born children of Adam, whom, whom God had, had made king over creation. All of us are, are natural-born children of Adam, who, who rebelled against the Lord, setting his dynasty against the will of God. And as we all know, God would have been perfectly just, wouldn't he have been, to have simply wiped out that dynasty for good. But what did God do and said? God pursued Adam, broken and maimed by the fall as he was. God pursued Adam, an enemy of God. And while Adam was still weak, trembling with fear all over, as we read in the Belgian Confession, hiding in the trees. While Adam was still a sinner, his fists also raised against the God of heaven like Saul, saying, you gave me the woman to fall into this temptation. While God, while Adam was still an enemy, God spoke a word of grace. That a day of reversal, a day of restoration would come. And then it happened. At just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And God showed his love for us, and that while we too are still sinners, Christ died for us. To state these things in Romans 5 backwards, Christ didn't die for us when we became strong enough to stand on our own two feet. He didn't die for us when we, when we made ourselves delightful to stand in his sight. He didn't die for us once we had finally started to overcome our sinfulness on our own. And God didn't reconcile us to himself when we were friendly, when we were worthy of his friendship. But when we are precisely the opposite of these things, the king showed us the most unexpected kindness in all the world. While we were still sinners, the king died for us. King David restores to Mephibosheth all that had once belonged to the house of Saul. He says, do not fear. Do not be afraid. I will show you kindness. Do not be afraid. I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father. Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belonged to Saul and to all his house, I have, I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall, 
till the land for him and shall bring him the produce that your master's grandson may always have bread to eat. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants, and Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servants, so will your servant do. And so all that was lost in Saul's fall from royalty was returned and restored. But even more significant than that, King David does what? He grants to Mephibosheth the great privilege to eat at his table always, as though he were one of the king's sons. That's what David says, you shall eat at my table always, as though you were one of my sons. In other words, Mephibosheth is adopted into the king's family. Not only is his property given to him, not only is he promised perpetual provision, but he's also given a new position. He is granted to eat at the king's table always. The king's unexpected kindness is displayed most powerfully in his unending communion. Many have suggested that no place in all the Old Testament is the doctrine of adoption so powerfully illustrated as it is for us here in Second Samuel chapter 9. Chapter 12 of the Westminster Confession of Faith gives us a wonderful definition of adoption. Page 912 in the back of the Trinity Psalter hymnals, there we confess with our Presbyterian brothers and sisters that all those who are justified, God grants in and for the sake of His Son to make partakers of the grace of adoption by which they are taken into the number and enjoy the liberties and privileges of the children of God. They have His name put upon them, and they receive the spirit of adoption. They have access to the throne of grace with boldness. They are unable to cry, Abba, Father. They are pitied, protected, and provided for. They are chastened by Him as by a father, and yet they are never cast off but they are sealed unto the day of redemption, inheriting the promises as heirs of everlasting salvation. And that's what's happening here in 2 Samuel chapter 9. This is what can be said here of Mephibosheth. He is taken in by the king. He is pitied, protected, and provided for. He will never be cast off, but he will have a place to sit at the king's table always. Four times in this passage we read about Mephibosheth eating at the king's table, lame in both his feet, a grandson of the rebel king Saul, the king of the former regime, Mephibosheth, whose name literally means shamefulness or, or scatter of shame, is the son of shame. He comes from Lodabar, which translated literally would mean from nowhere. And here we read of the son of shame from the land of nowhere being brought to the very palace of the king. And he's given a place to sit forever at the king's table. And so how can Mephibosheth respond then to say, what is your servant? What is your servant that such a, a dead dog as I should have a place at your table? What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog such as I. Mephibosheth, you see, understands that he is far from worthy of receiving the king's kindness. What right, after all, has a son of Saul, a man crippled in both his feet, what right has a poor, unworthy servant like this to be seated at the king's table? And the same question would be asked of us this morning. What, what right do we have, if, if left to our sin and shame, to, to be seated at the king's table? And of course, like Mephibosheth, we know that we have no right in ourselves. Dead dogs such as us. No right at all except for the profound reality that our king is gracious and kind. No right at all except for the fact that ours is a king who, who lays down his life not for the righteous but for the unrighteous. That ours is a king who, who sets on his gaze not on those who are so lovely 
and lovable, but those who are unlovely and unlovable. No right to come except for the fact that we have a king who, who came to save not the righteous, but to save sinners, who came to save the unworthy, not the worthy. And if you recognize that this morning, if you believe that, then the table is for you. This table is not for those who, who come in their own competence. But this table is for those who have nothing in their hands to bring except the promise of the Savior who is a good and gracious king. Two times we're told in this passage that Mephibosheth is lame in both his feet, a sign of shame in the ancient world. But four times we're told he has a seat at the king's table a picture of grace if there ever was one. Double grace for his shame. I don't know how much examining of yourselves you did in the last week, but I'm here to tell you this morning that no matter how much it was, it wasn't enough if you think it was enough. Because none of us can worthy ourselves up enough to come to the table, not on our own. For in ourselves, we are all sons and daughters of shame from the land of nowhere, lame in both our feet. None of us has the strength to, to hobble our way back into the kingdom of God, let alone the ability to, to pull ourselves up to the king's table. But King Jesus does for us we can't do on our own. He himself seats us at his table because he loves us and for the sake of the promise. And so it is in that confidence that we come to the table this morning. God extends his grace to, to dead dogs such as I. He extends his grace to unworthy and needy sinners such as us. He grants us a seat at the table that we might commune with him always. And so as we heard last week in the preparatory, the solemn warning is, is not designed to discourage you. We are not come to the supper as though we were righteous in ourselves, but rather to testify that we are sinners, that we look to Christ for our salvation. And so even though we do not have perfect faith, we are confident that our Savior accepts us at His table and we come in humble faith. If you see yourself in Mephibosheth, the table is for you. And the good news of the gospel is this. Our king really is who the Bible says he is. He is a good and gracious king. As we'll sing in just a few moments, he's the kind of king of, of whom it's been said in the Psalms, from dust he lifts the needy one, from ashes raises those bowed down. He seats them by his mighty hand among the princes of the land. That's us this morning. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we do come before you as dead dogs. We come before you as unworthy sinners, as those who are sons and daughters of shame, lame in both our feet. We come before you as sons and daughters who were born to the former regime, the regime of King Adam. We come before you as needy, broken-down sinners, maimed by the fall, and were it not for your grace, we would be trembling with fear. Were it not for your grace, we would come to the table with much trepidation. We thank you, O God, that you speak to us in this your word, and you remind us that we come not in ourselves. Nothing in our hands we bring but the promise of a Savior who is a good and gracious King. As we come to the table, or may we come for that promise held fast in our hands. We come as children of the promise, as those who are pitied, protected, and provided for, as those whose foreheads now have on them the name of King Jesus. We thank you, God, for setting this table before us in the presence of our enemies. We thank you for the promise that goodness and mercy shall indeed pursue us all the days of our life, that you are a God who initiates as well as finishes, that you begin a good work of grace in us and you bring it to completion on the day of Christ's coming. 
And so as we come to the table, Lord, we pray that you would lift our hearts up to heaven, to Christ's table, even as we know he condescends to us by his spirit here and now. We pray these things not because we are worthy, but because the king is worthy, and he makes us so. Amen. For a song of preparation, let's stand to sing Psalm 119.